So today we're going to shift gears a little bit and for the first time we're going to introduce time varying fields. So far we've looked at the four Maxwell's equations and they go as follows. First of all, we have the Gauss's law for electricity which states E dotted with dA over a closed surface must equal the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. All right? This is called the Gauss's law of electricity, say. So this is one of the four Maxwell's equations. The second equation that we've seen is that B dotted with dA over some closed surface. Remember, these integrals are over closed surfaces. This equals, what does this equal? Zero. Because there are no magnetic monopoles. So this is the Gauss's law for magnetism. The third relationship that we see is, comes out from the conservation of energy. And that states that if we have an electric field and we take its path integral over a closed loop, right, it's a closed loop, this must equal, what does this equal to? Mu naught i. This must equal zero. Which means that we cannot make electric fields due to static charges that are curly. We cannot make electric fields of this kind. It's impossible to create a pattern of fields which is a tangent along the circle. Such fields are also called curly fields. We cannot make curly electric fields if we just have static charges because we've been only dealing with static charges. Although we've seen currents which are moving uh, charges, but with static charges, we cannot have an electric field of this kind. So the statement is E dot dL is zero because E dot dL, the negative of this is also the work done in carrying by the electric field as a charge goes around a complete path. That work done has to be zero, otherwise the charge can go round and round in the circle and its energy can keep on increasing. That's not allowed by the conservation of energy. Okay? So this E dot dL over the closed loop is zero. In other words, the electric field is a conservative field. The fourth uh, rule that we've seen is B dot dL over a closed loop, right? So this is a closed loop, closed loop. Closed surface, closed surface. This B dot dL equals mu naught times the current enclosed. Okay, the total current enclosed. This is called the Ampere's law. And we've seen several manifestations of the Ampere's law. These two laws are complete as I've written them. But these two laws, as I've written them, are incomplete, partial, partially correct. Because so far, I haven't considered time-varying electric or magnetic fields. Now today is going to be our first encounter with time-varying magnetic fields. Okay, so these are the four Maxwell's equations. Throughout this course, we've gone about 60 to 70, we've gone through these uh, Maxwell's equations in detail. But we would like to fill in the missing gaps. And we would like to complete the story and write down these two Maxwell's equations as they stand in their full glory. <clears throat> now, in order to motivate time varying magnetic fields, let me come up with the example of a solenoid. Suppose I have an infinitely long solenoid and some current. I flows through the solenoid. Okay? Now, if I look at the solenoid from the top, I have n, capital N terms of the solenoid. If I look from the top, 
I just see a coil and there are many other coils stacked beneath it and the current is flowing in a certain direction. Suppose this is the direction of the current, I. Then of course, if I am sitting inside the solenoid, okay, suppose this is an infinitely long solenoid. Now suppose, I am sitting inside the solenoid, I will see a magnetic field. Outside the solenoid, the field will be zero. So, the direction of the magnetic field will point into the plane of the paper. Let me, for convenience, uh, draw this current in this direction, okay? So that the field is pointing out of the plane of the paper, okay? So this is B. And the field is zero everywhere outside the solenoid. So outside the solenoid, it's zero, and inside it's uniform. And it's pointing out of the plane of the paper, okay? So this B inside is simply, its magnitude is given by mu naught, small n, i. Okay? So what's the field outside, the magnetic field outside? Zero. What's the electric field outside? Zero. Because this solenoid as it stands is a neutral object. It's quasi neutral, it does not have any charge stored in it. So there's no electric field outside the solenoid. Okay? So the electric field outside is zero and the magnetic field is also zero. Now suppose I make this current vary with time. So I make this a time dependent current, IT. For example, I can have a current of this form. Time, I, the current starts off at some value I naught and then it ramps up with time. So I have a power supply connected to the solenoid so that it changes the current in a linear fashion. So this is the current through the solenoid. Now I would, I know that this B inside will also become time dependent. Okay, so the B is also going to shift up. So with time, B is also going to change linearly in tandem with the current. Current changes linearly, the field inside will change linearly, but outside the magnetic field is still going to be zero. Now we have to see what is the electric field going to be outside uh, this uh, solenoid. Now these were experiments performed by one of the greatest experimenters of all time and his name was Michael Faraday in the 1820s. Okay? Now what Michael Faraday did, if one were to connect a piece of wire outside the solenoid and say have a bulb here, this bulb, if the current starts to change, the magnetic field starts to change, this bulb starts to glow. Which means a current, some current, capital I, flows through this external piece of wire and it makes the current glow. Energy is being dissipated here. So, there has to be some source of energy. That source of energy is driving a current. In, the, in other words, even though there is no physical battery in this circuit, there is some other entity or object that is playing the role of a battery. That is providing energy for current to flow inside this wire and the bulb glows. Faraday called this effect magnetic induction. <clears throat> okay. And it still holds to its, to its name today. It's still called electromagnetic or magnetic induction. Alright. So if I take this circular path, Okay, and it's coaxial with the solenoid. And if I were now, if a current is flowing in this circuit, okay, now this is a piece of wire, it's a piece of metal. So if I draw a zoom in view of this piece of wire, okay, this is what the wire looks like. If a current is flowing in a certain direction, there has to be an electric field inside this wire, okay, because it's only an electric field that can create drift velocity and charges can flow and it can produce a current. First of all, let's figure out the direction of this external current. 
Now I'm going to state a fact, an observational fact, an empirical fact, which is true in all cases. No violations to this fact have ever been seen. If this current is going up, the magnetic field is going up, it's pointing out of the plane and it's increasing. Okay? So my rate of change of the magnetic field dB by dt is out of the plane of the paper, right? So field is changing. Uh, it's increasing, so more and more field is coming out. So per unit time, the change in magnetic field, the, the additional field is also pointing out of the plane of the paper. So dB by dt is outside. Minus dB by dt is in the plane of the paper, right? Because it's a minus sign here. So minus dB by dt is into the plane of the paper. Now current is going to flow this is conventional current by the way, in this external circuit such that if I point my thumb in the direction of minus dB by dt then the fingers would curl in the direction of current. So current is going to flow in this particular direction, the conventional current. Okay. Now there is no physical battery in this wire. This EMF which makes the current go round in the circuit must come from something. Alright, now if you look at this a cross section of this conductor, if a current flows in this direction, so the J vector, in, in green I am showing the J vector, okay, J is coaxial with the length of the conductor, okay, because the current is flowing parallel to the conductor as it should, it's a uniform wire. Now if J is in this direction, there has to be an electric field which is parallel to the current and through and therefore parallel to the axis of the twisting wire. So this E that is produced outside, has to be produced outside uh, the solenoid. This is the confines of the solenoid. The solenoid ends here, these are the wires of the solenoid and this is some external wire that we wrap around the solenoid. Now there has to be an electric field outside the solenoid which makes the current go round in the circuit. This electric field is parallel with the current density that is created. This is an induced current. Now this electric field is not coming from any distribution of charges. Okay? It's not being produced by any charges. In, in the entire uh, space that we see, there is no volume where a net charge exists. Everything is neutral. Even the current carrying solenoid is neutral. Of course, there is small charges on the wires of the solenoid which make the current flow through the solenoid, but for every positive charge there is a negative charge. So, overall, this electric field is not coming from any distribution of charges. It's not coming from any Coulombic effects in other words. This E that I've written here, generally one can write a subscript and C with it. This electric field is coming from non-Coulomb sources. or no, it's, no, it's a non-conservative field. So C is, a, is an apt letter because this represents Coulomb as well as conservative. This electric field is non-Coulomb. It's not coming from any charges. So not only charges can produce electric fields, Time varying magnetic fields can also produce electric fields. Time varying magnetic fields stand hand to hand with static charges. Time varying magnetic fields play the same role as static charges in creating electric fields. And the kind of electric fields they create are non conservative. What does this mean? This means that if I, now if a Continuous current flows through this circuit. So there has to be an electric field all around, all around the wire. And if I traverse this loop in this direction, okay, if I go around the loop parallel with the direction of the current, parallel with the direction of the electric field, and I write E N C dotted with dl. Okay? I go around the loop. Let's call this loop P. This is a closed path. I go around P. 
Because this is non-zero here. Because E is always parallel to L. Okay? So this thing is non-zero. Where is this electric field coming from? This electric field is coming from a time varying magnetic field. Okay? Now if all of a sudden this at some time t naught the current becomes constant again. The time variation of the current ceases. It becomes a steady current through the solenoid. At that point, there is no change in the magnetic field and this E and C drops back to zero and the current diminishes. Goes back to zero. After some transients. All right. So what Faraday observed, he observed that this relationship E dot DL has to be modified. Because his experimental observation was that whenever he placed a loop of wire, say a loop of wire and a galvanometer for example, okay, so I'm stating, in, stating what happens in nature. You have a loop of wire and inside this loop of wire you have a region where there is some magnetic field. For example, the magnetic field is pointing out of the plane of the paper. Arbitrarily shaped region in which there is this field and an arbitrarily shaped loop of wire. Now, if this field is constant, the galvanometer shows zero. No current flows through the circuit. However, whenever this field changes its magnitude, the galvanometer needle registers a deflection, which means a current is flowing through this circuit. Okay? If the magnetic field was placed here and the loop did not enclose the region in which the magnetic field was changing, so if the magnetic field was placed here, then no matter how vociferously or how strongly you change this magnetic field with time, the galvanometer will not show any deflection. Okay. So, suppose I remove this part and I just have the magnetic field outside the wire. And this wire does not enclose the region in which there exists a magnetic field. No matter how strongly I change this magnetic field. Now, I can change this field strongly in two ways. If I have dV by dt, If I have this quantity, I can change it in two ways. I can change the magnitude of B, I can change its direction, which means I can change the vector B. The other possibility is I can make the same change in a small period of time. So I can make quicker changes. I can make quicker and bigger changes. Both quicker and bigger changes will make give me a bigger value of this derivative of B. So even if I make a strong changes in the magnetic field, but the wire the loop of wire does not enclose the region in which the field is changing. It will not register any deflection. So, Maxwell from this observation noted the following. If I have an electric field dotted with DL, okay? Now, an electric field around a closed path. So, this must be a closed path over which you are finding the dot product and integrating. Now this electric field can have a coulombic part plus a non-coulombic part. Okay. Now what is, if I go here, what is EC dotted with DL? So, this dot product can be decomposed into EC dotted with DL and non-coulombic electric fields dotted with DL. What is this quantity equal to? Zero. It has to be zero. Okay. Now, this quantity ENC dotted with DL, that is the line integral of the electric field over a closed path, 
must be given by the amount of the rate of change of flux, magnetic flux, through the area on whose boundary lies the closed path. Okay, let me first write down this statement, then I'll explain what this means. So, ENC dot DL, which must equal E dot DL, is minus the de time derivative of B dotted with DA. So, this is E dotted with DL over a closed path. I give you half a minute to just write this down and then I'll explain what this means. I'll explain that. Why should it be plus? You have to choose one, right? And I'll explain what, what do you choose. So, let's go some joke. Let me make a recourse to Ampere's law because you've already seen this kind of construction in the Ampere's law. Look, Ampere's law means what? Ampere's law means you have a closed path, some path, okay, and you find the total current. Now, this path, let's call this path P, is on the edge. Of some area, okay. The area is shown in this light yellow color here. Okay. Is this area closed? No, it's not closed. It's an open area. Okay. It does not. With this closed area, you cannot have an inside and an outside. A closed area is something that we've seen in Gauss's law. You have a sphere. That's a closed surface area. There's an inside and an outside. A an animal, a small animal that lives inside, cannot go outside without piercing the boundary, without puncturing the body, the, the area. Okay? So if there's an animal inside this closed area, he, has, he or she, it has to make some puncture to get out. Right? Whereas this is not a closed area, this is a flat area. If there is an animal living on, on this side, he can, it can just go around the corner and go to the, to the other side. So this is not a closed area. It's, it's just like the surface of this table. But if I make this table into a box, that is I have a face here and a face here and a face at the bottom, then it becomes a closed area. So Gauss's law works with closed areas. You must know that. Whereas Ampere's law, in Ampere's law, there is a path and this path is on the boundary, on the perimeter of an open area. Right? This path is closed. You start at point A, you can get back to, you have to get back to point A. So the path is closed, but the area which it bounds is not closed, it's an open area. So Ampere's law simply states that if you take this closed path P and compute V dot DL, and integrate over this closed path, you will get mu naught times the current I that is enclosed by the path. I mean, how much current pierces this closed area? This is the Ampere's law. Exactly the same thing is happening here. What's happening here is if I have a closed path P, okay, and I would like to find E dot DL about this closed path. So I move in some direction on this closed path. Okay? And I would like to find E dotted with DL. 
about this closed path P, then I would get what would this equal to? If there are no magnetic fields or there are magnetic fields that are not changing with time. Okay? And if there are if there are no electric fields or if there are electric fields, that doesn't matter. Uh, then this has to be zero. This is zero only when if only when there are no time varying magnetic fields. If there exists a magnetic field but it's not changing with time, this is still zero. If there is current that is coming out of this plane or going into this plane, E dot DL over this closed part will still be zero. Okay. This is our partial version of the of the law that we've number written at number three. But this law changes. We have to correct it when there are time varying magnetic fields. And the correction goes as follows that E dot DL over this path P equals minus D by DT of derivative of an integral. Okay? And what is that integral? That is B dotted with DA. So what is B, what is DA? The left hand side is clear. Okay, so I take this path P and I calculate E dot DL. So there is some electric field in this region which I want to calculate. I take the dot product of the electric field at each point. I take the dot product of electric field with DL here. I take the dot product of electric field here, here. Everywhere I take the dot products and then sum over all the dot products. Over this entire path. Now this line integral, this path integral must equal minus d by dt, I'll explain the minus sign, integral of b dotted with dA. Now what is b dotted with dA? A is an area and it is the area that is enclosed by the path P. So you consider this area. So B dot DA is basically the dot product of the magnetic field with the small area element. So if I take a small area patch and find the dot product of some magnetic field with this area vector, I get a B dot DK. I repeat this procedure for all the patches inside the area, the blue area that is bounded by the path. I get this integral B dot DA. And then I take its time derivative. This will be equal to with a minus sign to the left hand side, which is just a line integral of E over the path B. I give you half a minute just to let this sink into you. So this is an integral of B dot DA. <coughs> now if you look at just this integral, B dot DA, first question. If you look at the Gauss's law for magnetism number 2, shouldn't this be equal to 0? Why shouldn't this be equal to 0? Should it be equal to 0? Black ये जीरो नहीं होना चाहिए क्योंकि लेफ्ट हैंड साइड वहाँ तो हमने जीरो लिखा है इसको जीरो होना चाहिए आप बताएं नहीं टाइम देनी तो बात की बात सिर्फ मैं इस इंटेग्रल को देखूँगा तो ये तो जीरो नहीं लिखा हुआ वहाँ पे जी एक्सेक्टली वो जो गॉसेस लॉ फॉर मैग्नेटिक फील्ड्स फॉर क्लोज सरफेसेस this is just an open area that has a perimeter, it has a fence around it, but it's not a closed area. 
Okay, so B dot D A about this path will not be zero. So physically, what does B dot D A over this area really mean? We call it the flux, the magnetic flux through this area. So this becomes simpler to understand. In other words, E dotted with D L over a closed path equals minus the derivative of the flux phi I can also put an n here if I like magnetic flux through the area that is enclosed by the path so I make a path I find the area that is inside the path this tarah bachon ke bulbulon wale khilona hai theek hai ye aap is tarah uski ek ring hota hai और यहां पे पानी होता है ठीक है साबुन वाला पानी तो दिस इज दी रिंग दिस इज दार्ट एंड दिस इज द एरिया नाउ यू हैव टू फाइंड आउट दी फ्लक्स थ्रू दिस एरिया दिस इज एन ओपन एरिया लाइक वाइज यू हैव अ पार्ट यू वुड लाइक टू फाइंड द फ्लक्स थ्रू द एरिया विच लाइक इन साइड द पार्ट इट जस्ट एन एन एनोलोग टू द एम्पेयर लॉ इन एम्पेयर लॉ you take b dot dl and mu not times the current that goes through this area here you have e dot dl and you have the negative of the time derivative of b dot da in other words you have the negative of the time derivative of the flux through the area on whose perimeter lies the path okay now my question is this is a derivative this is an integral doesn't the derivative cancel out the integral why not because this is over space this integral is over space whereas this derivative is with respect to time so this relationship is one of the four amperes uh, one of the four maxwell's equations it's called the faraday's law okay this also means that this maxwell's equation can be modified this can be modified to minus d by dt integral of b dotted with da okay all right now let's revert to this example here and let's look at an emf that corresponds to this electric field first of all you observe that curly electric fields are possible if you have time varying magnetic fields okay <clears throat> now a very interesting observation you learn physics by in inflicting your minds to conflict to put conflict in your mind and then you learn by counter examples this is what i'm trying to do here now suppose i have a solenoid okay you look at the solenoid from the top current is coming out of uh, sorry the field is coming out of the solenoid b button a this radius is capital r this is the radius of the solenoid there is no magnetic field outside and then i take kya ho gaya and then i take a path outside the solenoid and what i am interested in is first of all i would like to apply the faraday's law if this current through the solenoid which i denote as small i is changing with time there has to be an electric field in this loop on this loop okay because of faraday's law okay now the magnetic field exists only inside this region remember okay because it's a solenoid there's no magnetic field outside theek hai magnetic field se this ke andar hi hogi na chahe current kam ho jaye bahar jaye magnetic field bahar nahi leak out karte ja sakte magnetic field ye bada important point hai acha
अब हमने ये देखना है कि वॉट डायरेक्शन इज द इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड पॉइंटिंग इन आउट साइड द सोलोनाइट वॉट इज द डायरेक्शन ऑफ द इंड्यूस्ड फील्ड और द नॉन कंजर्वेटिव फील्ड दैट इज प्रोड्यूस बिकॉज ऑफ द चेंज ऑफ द करंट सपोज द करंट इंक्रीजेज विद टाइम आई इज इंक्रीजिंग विद टाइम सो मोर एंड मोर करंट इज फ्लोइंग द सोलोनाइट वॉट कैन आई से अबाउट द मैग्नेटिक फील्ड इंक्रीजिंग विद टाइम ओके सो बी इज इंक्रीजिंग विद टाइम and this is only the b inside there is no b outside remember this so this magnetic field that's coming out of the solenoid is increasing with time now i have a path p and this path is on the outer surface hypothetical path is on the outer surface of an area now there is flux coming out of this area okay now what is the flux coming out of the area on whose boundary lies the path what is the flux what is phi m it's b pi r square okay plus zero outer what does this mean there is only magnetic field inside the region of the solenoid and there is zero magnetic field outside so really you have to take into account the magnetic field that's anywhere inside this path but there is no magnetic field in this region So you just take a zero here. So what you left with is that the flux through the area on whose boundary lies P is simply B pi r square. But remember, this B depends upon time because the current is changing. So this is pi r square. B is simply mu naught n i small i, which is a function of time. So this is the flux passing, piercing the area on whose boundary lies. the path p now if i would like to find out okay i know phi this there exists a phi m and it's changing with time this is the phi m that has become a function of time now is the flux that's coming out increasing with time or it's decreasing with time it's increasing with time so d phi by dt is it's increasing with time and it's coming out with time the flux is coming out so this the direction of this derivative is out okay because there's more flux coming out with time the flux that's coming out is increasing so if i put a minus sign with this minus d phi out by dt then this is really pointing in remember flux is not a vector it's a scalar but i can assign a positive or negative sign to it and this is the meaning of the negative sign here i look at the negative of the direction in which the flux is increasing so if the flux is increasing coming out minus d phi by dt is going in okay now if minus d phi by dt is going in that determines the direction of the electric field e dot dl or the current that flows as a result or you can look at this in the following way if the current is increasing and it's coming out the magnetic field is also coming out and it's increasing with time so the flux that is piercing this area coming out is increasing so i take the negative of that direction point my finger in the right of the right hand in the direction of minus d phi by dt and then my right hand fingers will curl in the direction of the conventional current capital i that is induced inside this wire now this is a physical wire if i didn't have a physical wire suppose i didn't have a physical wire then no current can flow in this region because this is just space there are no mobile charge carriers so the current is just a corollary which means that the current is not the basic thing it's just a deduction i mean if there is a conductor here a current can flow what is basic is that an electric field is produced and the direction of that electric field is tangent to the circle and it's pointing in this direction so a curly electric field e non conservative is produced whose direction is 
all along the tangent to this hypothetical path P. Now choosing whether this electric field is pointing in this direction or in the opposite direction is determined by minus d phi by dt. Okay? Now an, a non-conservative electric field is developed and if I take E, this non-conservative field dotted with dl over this closed path, then this, its magnitude will be equal to pi r square mu naught n di by dt. Okay? It's just going to be the derivative of this flux. Do you understand the electric field argument? Good question. What I've done here, I've looked at the Faraday's law. Okay. I found the flux through an area. I have identified a path P, a hypothetical path in space that is coaxial with the solenoid for symmetry arguments. I found the flux through the area inside the green path, taken its derivative, right? And this is what I get. Okay, this is what I get. The derivative is equal to this. Now this must equal E n dot dl over the closed path. Now this is non-zero. Okay. Now let's look at the left hand side, E n c dot dl. If this path is a circle, it's at a certain radius small r from the center of the solenoid. Okay, and it's tangential to the path. Okay. The first thing is we have to choose whether I should draw the electric field lines like, like this. Okay, so this is one possibility of drawing the electric field lines. The second possibility is that I can draw them like this. Okay, now choosing either of these patterns depends upon the right hand side. It's determined by this. Minus d phi out by dt. Okay, now here what's happening is that the flux with time, that's it's coming out and it's increasing in magnitude. Okay, because the current is going up, the flux that's coming out is increasing. So d phi by dt is just tells you how much flux do we have per unit time. And it's coming out. More flux is coming out per unit time. So minus d phi by dt is pointing into the plane of the paper here. So I have my thumb pointing in the direction of minus d phi by dt. This the fingers will point in the direction of the electric field. So this is the direction. This is the correct direction. If the current were decreasing on the other hand, if the current were decreasing, then d phi by d out would be pointing in the inward direction. Okay? Then minus d phi by d out would be pointing in the outward direction. And then I would get an electric field of this kind. So if the current is increasing, I will, through the solenoid by the way, then this is the electric field pattern I get. If the current is decreasing, this is the electric field pattern I get. Now, the question uh, which the lady has asked is the following. Where in space does this electric field exist? Okay. Now, if I look at the left hand side and I worry, I don't worry about the negative sign. I'm only talking about magnitudes now. I have E n C. Okay, I, I can drop this E N C. I don't have to write this all the time. I know it's a non coulombic electric field that's coming out because of a time varying magnetic field. First question, is the magnitude of this vector the same as this vector? Yes, it has to be because of symmetry arguments. 
this vector cannot be of a different magnitude than this vector because it's equidistant from the from the solenoid. Okay, so all of these electric fields have to be of the same magnitude, and all of them are parallel to the direction of traversal of this path. Okay, so this left hand side is really E D L over the path. This E is a constant. It's E. Now the length of this path is simply two pi small r. Okay. Now this E of two pi r must equal its magnitude because we're not worrying about the negative sign. Equals pi r squared, where r is the radius of the solenoid. Mu naught n d i by d t. So this electric field that is produced in space, the non-conservative electric field that is produced not by charges but by time-varying magnetic fields, equals r squared mu naught n over 2 di by dt divided by r. So this tells us. that if i have a solenoid this is my solenoid suppose a current i flows through it which varies with time then an electric field is produced everywhere in space okay it's produced everywhere in space but if you increase the distance from the solenoid the electric field drops off as 1 over r so here the electric field will be stronger Here, the, at another radius, which is further away from the solenoid, the field will be non-zero. It will exist, but it will be weaker, smaller. That's why I'm drawing smaller vectors. Here, it will be even weaker. Okay. So the field will exist everywhere in space, but its magnitude will drop as one over r because of this factor here. Okay. Now, if there is an electric field, and if this is in vacuum, everywhere this vacuum, no mobile carriers, there can be no current. But suppose at at this distance we place a conductor looped into the looped into a circle. Okay, just like what we've done over there on the second blackboard. So now we have a solenoid. and we have a conductor outside at a certain radius r it's a very thin conductor by the way but nevertheless it's there now the current that's flowing through the solenoid and hence the magnetic field is increasing with time suppose then the electric field is pointing in this direction tangential to this path to this wire to this conducting wire what will this electric field do will it create some current of its own if there is an electric field inside a conductor which is parallel to the conductor then you can the conductor cannot be in electrostatic equilibrium so there has to be current flowing through this wire so this induced electric field which comes out because of the time varying magnetic field produces a produces a current through this conductor that current flows in this general direction okay this is the direction of the capital i which is flowing in this conductor as a result of the electric field that has been produced but this is an induced current and i am differentiating this from the so from the solenoid current by putting this in capital so this is an induced current now if there is an induced current even though you don't have a battery in this wire something else is playing the role of a battery okay the time varying magnetic field which has nothing to do with charges nothing to do with coulombic forces is playing the role of a battery okay so there has it's producing an emf now if you have a closed if <clears throat> the resistance of this wire suppose is capital r 
and there is a current flowing through it, then we all know that there is a potential drop of capital I R in this circuit. Right? This is this is the potential drop I R in the circuit. This resistance will have some wire. So if a charge carrier starts here and goes around the circuit, then the there has to be a potential drop, capital I R. Where is this potential drop coming from? We know that in a closed path, in a closed path, uh, the potential drop, there is zero potential drop. We have to satisfy Kirchhoff voltage law. So there has to be an EMF E that exists which drives this current such that E equals IR. So this is an EMF. Okay. In other words, this EMF minus IR must equal 0. Now where is this EMF coming from? Right. This EMF is coming from the changing magnetic flux through the path. Okay. Now what we've noticed is that E dot DL is non-zero. It's the rate of change of flux. And if I... <coughs> Okay, let me draw a, a conventional circuit so that I can bring home this idea more clearly. What is a battery? So this is a model of a battery. The model of the battery, as we all know, comprises a conveyor belt that is transporting negative charge from plate A to plate B. Okay. So a charge separation is created and this charge separation can drive a current through the circuit. When the steady state is reached, the number of electrons that are entering the plate B per unit time is equal to the number of electrons leaving the plate per unit time. So instead we say this is the condition that we've achieved. Now in this closed path, if you look at the electric fields, the electric field inside the conductor is pointing in this general direction. It's parallel to the direction of the conventional current. Okay. Here, the electric field is pointing in the opposite direction. Look at the charge separation, the electric field is pointing in the opposite direction inside the terminals of the battery. Okay? And where is this electric field? Where has it arisen from? It has arisen from the fact that there was a motor that was moving and it had a conveyor belt attached to it and it was transporting charge from A to B. This motor was being driven by it, it's a mechanical supply. It's driving the charges from point A to point B. So this electric field that has been set up inside the battery is from non-coulombic. It's of a non-coulombic origin. It's from a, it has a mechanical origin. When we studied motional EMF, an EMF was generated across the ends of a conductor. That EMF was coming out not from magnetic fields or electric fields. It was coming out because there was an external agent that was driving the rod with a uniform speed. So this non-coulombic origin is creating an electric field inside the battery. Now if you look at this circuit, and if I have, say, a positive charge, suppose I take a hypothetical positive charge, and it's point A, and I would like to move it, go around the circuit, its energy will change. Its potential energy will change. So in going from A, from, thi from this, okay, let's call it B, from going from B to capital A, its potential energy is going up. How much is it going up? It's going up by small e into the EMF of this battery. This is the increase in its potential energy. Okay? And when it goes from around the circuit, from this point, capital A, to this plate B, around the circuit, its potential energy drops. Because it's moving away from the positive charge now. 
How much does it put in? its potential energy drop? Its potential energy drops by I into R, the resistance of this circuit. Okay? And this must equal zero because when it reaches this point again, its energy must be the same. Energy has to be conserved, whether you're dealing with conservative forces or non-conservative forces. Right? Here the electric field is of some origin, but no matter what the origin of electric field is, in a closed path, this potential energy has changed, the potential energy has to be zero. Otherwise, you can make perpetual motion machines. So this means that, and there's an E here as well, by the way. Okay? So this means that capital, uh, this EMF must equal IR. Potential drop is the energy ke liye charge bhi energy, you know? All right, so this means that the EMF of this battery is equal to IR or in other words, the current that is flowing in this circuit is equal to some EMF provided by some battery over R. Okay, now this EMF is, if, what is this EMF equal to? This EMF has been generated by the work done by the non-coulombic forces F and C in moving across this length S divided by E. This is the EMF. And we've looked at this in detail before the midterm. So now what we have here is again, we have a current that is flowing in this wire, which means there is some potential drop. But energy has to be conserved, which means that there is some source of EMF inside this, inside this wire. Even though there is no physical battery located in it, it's, there's nothing inserted into this wire. So that EMF is coming from the ghostly source of the changing magnetic field. That changing magnetic field that is piercing the area about which, on whose perimeter lies this circuit. Okay? Now what is EMF? EMF is simply the work done by non-coulombic forces divided by E. Right? This is the work done by non-coulombic forces divided by E. Now the work done by our non-coulombic forces divided by E in this case is simply E dot dl. Right? This is force per unit charge dotted with dl integrate. This is just the work done by non-coulombic forces. So this is just the EMF. So this means that the Faraday's law basically means that there is an EMF generated in a circuit. That EMF is given by E dotted with DL. This equals minus D by DT of B dotted with DA. This has to be a closed path. This is an area bounded by the closed path and it is also equal to minus d by dt phi m. So this is one of the four Maxwell's equations, it is called the Faraday's law. All of them are equivalent forms. I give you half a minute to relax and think about this. This is observational. You cannot derive Maxwell's equations from anything. Can you derive the Coulomb's law from anything? No, you can't. हम इसकी मजीद एग्जांपल्स करेंगे ना बहुत क्लैरिटी आ जाएगी आपको. फिक्र ना करें. examples. You see, you learn by examples. You learn by applying these somewhat abstract concepts. And through problems, it's where you learn. And you don't learn through talking in the class. Now, 
We've seen quite a bit of examples on emotional EMF. Suppose I have a resistor, R, and these are rails that are non-resistive, and I have a rod that is moving with a uniform speed V towards the right, and there is a magnetic field that's pointing into the plane of the paper. From first principle calculations, we drew the force body diagrams and calculated what the EMF would be. And that EMF turned out to be equal to VBL, where L is this length. Right? So this is something we done from force body diagrams. And there were long lengthy calculations. Let's see if we can use the Faraday's law to achieve the same result. Now this, what I am highlighting in pink, represents a closed path. Okay? So this is my closed path P. Now what happens when everything is static but this rail is moving towards the right and there is a magnetic field everywhere in space. Okay? And this magnetic field by the way is not changing with time. It's just constant. It's not changing with time. Okay? But what is changing with time is the area enclosed by this pink path. So if I apply Faraday's law, I have EMF min is equal to minus d by dt, b dotted with dA. Now b is just constant. Now if you look at this magnetic field, it's pointing in. Suppose that the area vector of this complete loop is also pointing in. Let's suppose that, okay? We we'll worry about the minus sign. The minus sign is just giving you the direction of the EMF. Don't worry about this too much. So what, what is happening is that the magnetic field is also always making the same angle with the area vector. So And it's constant. So I can take this out of this integral. I can write this as minus b, d by dt of a. Correct? Now this area is changing with time because at some later location the rod has moved to this point. So the distance that ha it has moved in time say delta t is v delta t. Okay. So the area is now a function of time. So I get minus b d by dt the area is a function of time and what is the area? It's simply, uh, the area is, <coughs> this initial length, let's call it W, W naught, fixed, W naught plus V delta T, uh, V delta T into L, right? This is the time dependent area because with time the area is increasing and the new length becomes W naught plus V delta T. This length however remains the same so I have written W naught plus V delta T into L. Now take the time derivative, this is just a constant, I get minus V V L EMF. This is exactly the same result as this. Okay, don't worry about the negative sign, I can find out what the negative sign is is here and how, how do I find that out? Now <clears throat> the magnetic field is pointing in so the flux is also pointing into the plane of the paper. The flux is pointing into the plane of paper with time the flux pointing in is increasing. Okay? So if I take the negative of that direction that's pointing out. Okay? So the negative of the increase in flux is pointing out. Now I have my thumb in the direction of the negative of the increase in flux. This will give me the direction of the induced EMF or the electric field that is produced as a result. That electric field, the non coulombic field now drives a current through this circuit in this general direction. So this is the direction of the current that is being produced inside the circuit. Okay, and this EMF by the way, its magnitude must equal I into 
R because energy has to be conserved. Okay, so this EMF is being another way of looking at the induced EMF, the motional EMF, is through the lens of the Faraday's law. Okay, and the magnetic field is not doing anywhere. The magnetic field is being done by the fact that there is someone, some external engine that is burning its fuel to move this object with a constant speed. Because if you look at it, if there is a current flowing through this, through this uh, rod, it must have a force that is acting towards the, it must act, exert a force acting towards the left on this current carrying rod inside a, inside a magnetic field. In order to keep the speed constant in the right direction, external agent has to give in energy. All right. So this is a very nice illustration of the Faraday's law. Another application is just the generator. A coil inside a magnetic field. Now suppose I have a planar coil, a coil, okay, one turn, it's placed inside a magnetic field, a constant magnetic field. Now if I look at this coil from this direction, from the side, I will just see the edge of the coil and the electric field which is pointing in the upward direction, right? Now what happens is that if I have an axle attached to this coil and this axle is rotated, Right? through a motor for example it is rotated with some angular velocity omega ok so what, with time what is going to happen is that this about this pivot this coil is going to rotate right it is going to turn around in this general direction omega now I would like to find out whether an EMF is generated inside this loop which can make a current go around in this loop. Okay? Now, once again, I use the Faraday's law. The EMF is minus d by dt, b dotted with dA, Now, this is another variant of a dot product. I have a constant magnetic field whose direction is constant and I have a constant magnitude of the area but the direction of the area vector is changing. Right? So if I look here, the initially the area vector is pointing <coughs> in this direction, right? The area vector is pointing like this, A. It's pointing parallel to the field. The area vector is normal to the plane of the coil. So initially the area vector is pointing along the field. Its angle with the magnetic field is zero. With time, the area vector is tilting. It's changing with time. And what is the angle through which it changes? That's theta, which is a function of time. So now, if I would like to compute this integral, it's simply minus d by dt, b into the area into the cosine of the angle. Now, b is constant, a is constant, I just have cosine of theta, which is a function of time, minus b a cosine of derivative of the cosine of theta 
Now what is theta? जी theta क्या है अब बताओ theta क्या है omega t शाबाश theta is just omega t so this is b a omega sin omega t now when emf is generated that's proportional to the magnetic field the size of the coil and the angular frequency with which the coil rotates you rotate it faster and bigger emf will be generated and if i plot this emf versus time the emf is going to look like this it's a sinusoidal function this gives you an ac emf and if i have a load connected here it can drive a current through the load so this is a static circuit by the way so i need some carbon brushes which are also called commutators to make this connection between the rotating coil and the external load circuit so this emf is generated again because of the faraday effect because of one of four maxwell's equation and we know that without the generator we can't live my zindagi ka darmadar ab isko hai or remember this factor of omega determines how big an emf you generate you rotate the coil faster you get a bigger emf now in, on monday we going to have a proper lecture in that lecture i'll go give you some more examples of uh, the faraday's law some more interesting examples related to superconductors the skin effect ac ac fields and i'm surprised by all of these effects by the way so i i do expect some students to be at, at least wonder struck by what simple physics can teach you about something profound about nature all right so inshallah see you on monday thanks a lot